temperature there. But what we've been seeing of the the candidates running for state legislature in Pennsylvania, just everyone is so strong and seems to be doing so well. I think there's going to be some major shifts in uh, who's in, you know, hopefully shift in the majority in, in Pennsylvania, but at the very least, a, a large shift of seats. Absolutely. I mean, we have 203 seats and only, 80, only 83 of them are Democratic. So that means, obviously, when you're when you're looking to try to get legislation pushed forward, it's a it's a tough haul there. And be, and, and, and and it's it's a very uh, narrow needle to thread to be able to find currently in the current climate individuals across the aisle that might be willing to join you on that. And so being able to. You know, we we we've seen numbers that say there's comfortably 15, 16 seats out there that they believe are on path to flip, and upwards of of 18 to 20 seats that are currently having to fight. And when we have the current Speaker Terzai that is evidently out there knocking doors for the first time, and I don't know how long right now because <laughs> they're aware, uh, they're aware that nothing can be taken for granted right now, and there are a lot of people on both sides that are either frustrated with what their Republican Party has, has has become or inspired by a lot of the new Democratic leaders that are moving forward to try to, to and, and that aren't afraid uh, of pu- pushing forward a bold progressive agenda. And, and which I think is, you know, we, we've run away from this in the past. And I think we've learned our lesson that, that, that it's necessary to go big or go home. And, and, and from what I've seen, nobody's going home. So you already had a lot of uh, great endorsements, Planned Parenthood and Flippable and Moms Demand. And today you got another huge endorsement uh, from Barack yes. Obama. So congratulations on that. That's Thank super very exciting. Very exciting. Can you talk a little bit about what what endorsements in general, but what especially an endorsement like that means to your campaign? Visibility is the it's it's the target right now being able to to gain name name recognition out there knowing that i'm not a person that and the, the good news is i haven't been running for uh, haven't been in politics for for you know 10 to 12 years the bad news is i haven't been running for 10 to 12 years so i have i have a you know a, a gap to bridge there and and making sure that people are aware one that there's somebody running in this race it's been uh, it's been a number of years since there's been a you know a high profile race an aggressive ground campaign uh, that made people realize that they had a strong viable option. And so these kinds of endorsements, and particularly from President Obama, go a really long way in suddenly allowing uh, outside individuals to start paying attention. And, and we're in that part of the game right now where it is, for me, first and foremost, about getting out to meet voters. And uh, a lot of that does equate into money and also volunteerism, getting people that might want to come out. Maybe they're in a neighboring district. Maybe they're in New York and they are just excited about seeing their their sister purple state, Pennsylvania, flip blue again. So being able to to shine a spotlight on a race that they realize it's on its way to being flipped to try to help push that over by getting out, by phone banking, by 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 helping us with texting or or just being able to contribute to the campaign at any level possible, which means if we want to do some mailings out there to, to battle the, the, the amount of money that's going to be hemorrhaging against our campaign, that we have now new resources coming in to make that possible. And is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talk about? I think what's really important and one of the reasons that I'm running and one of the things that I think is being effective uh, in talking about the campaign has to do with transparency. It has to do with access to our elected officials. It's reminding people that ultimately these roles are your employees, that you are the boss and you have the right to understand first and foremost, what the job is, what it should be. Uh, It's not just, you know, it's not just about showing up for community events. It's not just, it's not, it's not just constituent services, although that is a huge part in something that we very much, uh, very much also value, but there are, there are important. There's an important role at the statewide level that can be filled in these roles, particularly with changes that are happening nationally right now. Particularly with these you know, potential appointments of of justices like Kavanaugh that can that can affect uh, the environment, that can affect individual liberties, that can affect women's rights, that can affect um, uh, voting rights uh, and health care, and that we can do things. Uh, at the statewide level, and people need to know where their current incumbents have voted, 
and whether it be very extreme positions on women's rights, as is, is the case with uh, Representative Mert, that, that, that has been on record in saying that his belief uh, is it under, with no exception, does he believe that a, abortion should be allowed to having the courage to step forward and, and, and be aggressive with making some common sense uh, changes uh, in our, our gun legislature, that we're putting the message. We have these report cards that we created to let people know the difference, where we stand, where we, where we agree. It's not, these aren't hatchet jobs and we're where we can do better. And, and, and again, it's all about access and transparency. And I think making sure that that people are are asking the necessary questions. And if at the end of the day, those questions are answered in a way that says, I believe we should reelect the, the current incumbent, at least people are informed. And that's the most important thing, I, I think, going into this election is just being informed. Absolutely. So if our listeners would like to help out your campaign, how can they do that? DarylBowling.com. That's bowling like the sport without the W. We're, <laughs> we're saving that saving that W for the win come November. So that's D A R Y L B O L I N G dot dot com. You can go to social media. You can go to Twitter. We're there as well. We we're, we've got a very very active presence. And again, any contributions of any size are huge. Or if you want to come out. Uh, and help us go meet some voters who talk about uh, the change we want to bring to the district here, the more the merrier. Excellent. We'll put a, a link to your website on our website as well. And I, I love the hashtag, let's go bowling. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, Daryl, thank you so much uh, for taking time to, to talk to me today. I know you've a got pleasure. a busy campaign and three little kids, so I appreciate sure. the time. Thank you. Welcome back to Two Broads Talking Politics. As usual, I am one of your co-hosts, Sophie, and I'm here with your other co-host, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Sophie. And joining us tonight is Don Allen. He is a Democrat running for the Delaware House of Representatives from District 36. Welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for joining us. Can you just sort of start off by telling us a little bit kind of about yourself and how you came to be running for the Delaware House? Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. I'm the product of a very blue-collar family. Uh, my mom and dad have owned and operated a construction company like my whole life. My grandfather was a member of the UAW and uh, worked at a Chrysler assembly plant here in Delaware. And my grandmother also worked at, at the, well, she worked at the University of Delaware after he passed away. So I'm the oldest of five, too. So I had a lot of brothers and sisters running around. And I was definitely the most aware, aware of what was going on in our family. I watched my parents have some really good times as owners of a small business, but also some really lean times. Then my dad put a hammer in my hand when I was 12. I started working with him in the summers and on weekends, and I've pretty much been working construction ever since then. I just turned 37, and then I've lived in Delaware my whole life. I met my wife, Carrie, in 2010. Moved into our current, current house right here in Milton this year. If uh, anybody's familiar with with Delaware. I know we're a small state, so hopefully some of your listeners are. Um, right down the street from Dogfish Head Brewery. So we got married in 2013. Our daughter Josie came along that the next year. She turned four last week. And she's my pride and joy. She's the she's one of the she's one of the reasons I'm doing this, just you know, not wanting her to grow up in the country that our current president kind of has us headed towards. So but um being a working guy my whole life, uh, one of the main reasons I'm running is just to put a focus back on hardworking men and women that are part of the working and middle class here in Delaware. Um, we truly are the people that drive the economy, in my opinion, and that's where the focus should be. So we've knocked a lot of doors and over and over, you know, we hear from people who have worked so hard to get ahead, but never quite get ahead. And it's the cost of childcare, it's student loans, it's, you know, it's never actually having an opportunity to lift themselves up. We have to start making sure that there are opportunities for everyone, that, um, that there will be opportunities for our children. Um, we have a lot of kids leave here after high school and never come back. Not because they want to, because this is a pretty great place to live. I'm about 10 miles from the Atlantic Ocean as we speak, but um, because we just don't have the kinds of jobs available to us here. If you aren't working in tourism industry or construction or agriculture, there just isn't anywhere for you to really go. So I tend to think of Delaware as a very democratic place. It's got democratic senators and uh, the one at large house seat is a uh, democrat it's of course where joe biden was from but you're the seat that you are 
running for right now is currently held by a Republican and he's been in office since I think the beginning of 2011. So what mm-hmm. is this district like? Uh, you know, is yep. it kind of purplish? Is it more or less Republican? What does that look like? So I live in Sussex County, which is the southernmost county of Delaware. We only have three of them. Uh, they're pretty much northern half, northern portion of Delaware, central portion of Delaware, and the southern part. And the southern portion of Delaware has been very red recently. My district in particular, the current representative is retired, so this is an open seat that I'm running for. But it has Democrats have the registration edge, but it's been going red lately. It went pretty, pretty handily for Trump um, this past election. But we're also on the East Coast, and we've kind of become a hub for retirees. So the district's also changing a lot. It was mainly agricultural, but with the retirees coming in and the healthcare industry that comes trans kind of comes along with that, it's, uh, it's pretty quickly changing. Um, we have pretty low property taxes, and the draw that our beach towns hold for everybody is, and, you know, if you're at all familiar with it, Rehoboth Beach or the nation's summer capital, as we call it, we're a prime vacation spot for people to live in D.C. That's really drawing a lot of people to the area, and with that, comes a lot of stress on our infrastructure, stress on our healthcare systems, our highways are overcrowded, and most doctors have ridiculously long waiting lists. And we also have a real problem with the quality of drinking water. As I said, like we're historically an agricultural district and we're not anymore. At least we're quickly moving away from that. And due to the past issues we've had with that and some current industrial abuses sadly, a huge portion of my district is having problems with drinking water. So certain a lot of issues here that we have to pay attention to that's starting to draw a lot of attention that's bringing change to a lot of people's minds. You mentioned coming from a working class background and being sort of a blue collar guy yourself. And a lot of, if not most of the people who run for higher office in this country are not blue collar folks. I wonder if you could, (laughs) I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of what that background adds to your campaign and sort of how that can really help you make decisions as part of the Delaware house. Yeah. I mean, so working construction pretty much my whole life, like I get why people voted for the current president. I don't, you know, obviously I don't agree with it, but I get it. Like I completely agree that our, our economy is kind of rigged against the middle class, against the working class. I, I'm hanging out with construction workers every day and I, I get it. They don't feel that they have a fair shot. They, uh, they feel like corporations are dominating our country to the point that it's hard for the average men or women to feel like they can get ahead, that they can you know, buy their homes, support their children, take a vacation now and then, uh, eventually save enough to retire. I, I hear from guys on the construction site every day. We have to work to even the playing field. We have to make sure that the middle class is respected and not walked all over. We have to work to raise wages for those that are making minimum wage up to those that are in the middle class. We have to close the income gap in this country because right now it's, it's already at an unsustainable point and it's still growing. Um, and that's how we win. We, we win by going door to door. You know, I'm not in a district that I need probably 3,500 votes to win. We're closing it on 6,000 doors now. And we go door to door and we talk about those values and we listen to the issues that are facing our neighbors. And call me naive, you know, maybe I'm idealistic, but I firmly believe that people will vote for a candidate that listens to them, that shares their experiences, that that cares about them. I'm on my third pair of canvassing shoes, so we've walked the walk, kind of, so to speak, and uh, we're putting in the work to win the thing. So tell me about uh, what it's like to be campaigning in a really small state. So, you know, obviously you're, you're talking about knocking on doors, but it seems like there's a lot of interaction between the candidates at various levels. You know, there's there's pictures on your feed of you with the, the governor and the senator. And, you know, so tell me a little bit about what that's like. Is there sort of a, a good infrastructure for all of the Democrats running? Yeah, it's very different when you live in a state like Delaware compared to, like, if you're living in Illinois or Wisconsin, I'm assuming. Like, when we live here, we expect to actually see and know our senators. Our current senators are Senator Carper and Senator Coons. Um, Senator Coons obviously been in the news a lot lately with the Kavanaugh deal. But, yeah, Senator Carper is running for re-election this year as well. And uh, I, I actually, he was he used to be our governor. And when he was the governor, I was Easter egg hunting on his front yard. And now I'm sharing a ballot with him. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're great to lean on. They're around a lot. Um, Senator Carper has been knocking on doors with me already. Uh, this coming weekend, I'll be knocking on doors with their, uh, the Democratic Party's nominee and next Attorney General, Kathy Jennings. So that's fantastic. Yeah, it's 
great 